Even now, the traditional way of selling your labor, of getting a job, was at the hiring fair, and that continued right up into the 30s. Young men would line up carrying their spades to be looked over and assessed by the better off farmers, who decide if your muscle was worth your keep and pay. Could you milk, plow, feed pigs, set potatoes? The two would then haggle over the price and settle on about 20 pounds for the seven busy months from May to November, about 10 pence a day in today's coin. The poet Kavner took the work, exulting that away from his family for the first time, he was as free as a fool's heart, but rising a cockcrow to work till dark soon saw him scurry back home. Hardier souls went much further afield to sell their labour. The annual migration of men, women and children from the west and northwest to Scotland for the potato picking was an established pattern of life. Pickers made about threepence an hour in modern times. They slept in communal sheds and ate free potatoes. Others made their way to the market gardens of Cheshire, to Lancashire and Yorkshire for the haymaking and turnip hoeing, down to Lincolnshire and North Cambridgeshire for the corn harvest, onto Warwickshire and Staffordshire for the potato digging, and home to Ireland again in November, until the next June when the cycle began again. It was the woman of the house who was the cohesive force, drawing together the strands of the family, holding them together. She was the source of encouragement and affection and the bridge to the father, in a family system in which, by tradition, a man didn't admit to emotions. And while the farm, the cattle and money was men's business, the home was her domain, though a demanding one. It was she who was up first in the morning to stir the turf fire to life before the men appeared and prepared breakfast of bread, eggs, milk and tea. Hanging on a hook over the fire, a kettle, which wouldn't rest all day. But the women didn't join the men at the table. They would eat when the men were finished. She would soon follow out into the yard to milk the cows in the sheds. That was seen as nimble-handed women's work, and ridicule would heap on any man who would cross that line of convention. Later, she would separate the cream, and it was her business to churn the butter. That butter was important, extra money to prop up the farm income. So were the hens and their eggs. The money they'd bring in was her money to spend as she decided, though of course it would be spent on some new advance for the family. Then there were the pigs and the poultry to be fed, with enormous pots of potatoes which she had boiled. As midday approached, her mind turned to dinner for the men. The ubiquitous potatoes, perhaps with some home-cured bacon and cabbage. And, as before, the women would not eat until the men had finished. The afternoon saw her boiling up more potatoes, chopping turnips and mangles for the pigs, mixing grain and milk for the calves. And the household water was where God put it, not where a man necessarily wanted it. That meant hauling the buckets to the house from the stream or the well though in the summer they saw better sense in doing their washing where the water ran. When the family had finished their tea, it was she who returned to the haggard to milk the cows, only later to join the others by the fire perhaps to sit and chat with neighbours in the glow of the paraffin lamp. And when all had gone to their beds, in the last task of the day, she banked up the turf fire, which next morning she would fan to new life in the first task of the new day. Childbirth was crucial because it meant continuity through the generations in the land and its ownership. That was the major concern. But aside from that, of course, even tiny hands could help share the burden of work. The girls would share the mother's chores, maintaining the divisions of tasks which came as naturally as day to them. They might carry the water in from the stream or busy themselves with the chickens. And in his early years, her little brother would share those same feminine chores. 
Together, they would take on errands, making their way across the fields to bring tea and doorstep sandwiches out into the hayfield, where they would join in the haymaking and the games. But a totally carefree childhood was short enough. By the time he made his first communion at six years, he would be sharing small chores with the men. By the time he was 10, he and his sister would be taken home from school to help in the sowing of the potatoes, the turnips or the grain. And again, later in the year, they'd be home from school for the critical harvest work. By the time he's 12 and had passed his confirmation, he would be at home to take on man's work under his father's tutelage and control. A relationship in which skills are proudly handed on and proudly received, but lacking any sign of intimacy. The son would remain the boy through his 30s and 40s until his father died or handed over the farm. The stuff of the tortured souls in many an Irish stage drama. But women began to see that they could achieve more if they broke out of their farm-bound isolation and banded together to tackle their condition, just as the menfolk had formed their farm business co-ops under Sir Horace Plunkett. So these ladies set up a sister co-op called the United Irish Women. Their aim was simply stated, in the home and the community, to do your work and do it better than before. They soon thought it wiser to drop their original title with its political overtones and became a nationwide social influence known as the Irish Countrywomen's Association. In classes, they brought new crafts to their members, like weaving and basket making, sometimes passing on old skills in danger of dying out. And those skills were turned to money, sometimes even into small businesses. They taught women to build up their on-farm potential making better butter, keeping better poultry, producing better eggs, selling them more profitably through their own country market network. And in friendly competition, they vied for honors in domestic skills like bread making and cooking, making their homes more comfortable. They set up community groups to help the improvement of education, public health, and to raise up local cultural and social life in a spirit of self-help. They saw that the dreariness of rural life was helping to drive out the young. And their new view of their role went beyond minding the egg money. They were urged to use the agricultural banks and they encouraged their husbands to do likewise. And they wanted to keep the farm accounts, entering a man's preserve. After all, their daughters were now most likely keeping the accounts in one of the town's shops, so why not at home, they reasoned. It meant more comfortable homes with a little more money. And beyond the homes, they wanted to build more vibrant communities and economies which would keep their children at home. In those simpler times, life made its way forward on very little money. The lack of a few shillings, however, didn't totally stifle humor and zest. You worked hard all week, but even the Lord rested on Sunday, and the word about a race, a match, a wake, or a carnival would quickly spread on the human telegraph. If it meant Shank's mare to get there, so be it. Better still if the family means rose to a gig into which the family would pile mother and father up front. And this was a special day out, one about which the parish would talk for many a long day, the day the aviator came to the village. This was the awesome height of man's technological endeavors, and women's too, since some of the few small aircraft seen in rural Ireland at the time were flown here by daring English socialites. But this was better again. You could actually fly in this one if you bought a wireless first. It was a proud home which could boast one of the new wirelesses, and in promoting them, the manufacturers had an ally in the government. No less an authority than Mr. de Valera himself thought they'd make rural life more acceptable to people. 
So, as the planes soared, they also brought the wireless means of opening a broader world to the people of the countryside. There was no more momentous sound to ring out over a parish than that of the church bell at a marriage ceremony. It meant a new alliance of families, of farms, of money. And leading up to the church ceremony and the lavish celebrations which would go on into the early hours of the morning, perhaps months of haggling and cajoling, lavish declarations of desirability, and not a little downright deception in the back bar of the local pub before the matchmaker. It was not the couple who made the match, but their parents. Marriage was about property as much as anything else, so it required a deal to be done. When a farmer was approaching the decision that it was time his chosen son took over the farm and married, now that he was 35 or 40 years of age, the father would begin to cast his eye about for a suitable wife for the son, and that meant a girl whose family could afford a dowry, people who had land and cash. At home, the matriarch would be kept informed of developments which needed her approval. The business afoot was also put to the prospective bride and groom, and if they showed themselves willing, the solicitor's office was the next stop. But there was one important step first. The boy's father had to walk the land of the girl's family and vice versa, to be sure each was dealing with a family of substance. It meant frantic whitewashing of the house, a goose was killed, whiskey and porter bought in. But some were not beyond enriching their circumstance by borrowing cattle from neighbours to temporarily raise themselves up in the world. And when found out, the match would be called off. But if all went well, a girl might be bringing 300 pounds with her. So both fathers would sign the writings as they were known. Half the money to be paid over on the wedding day, half a year later. Watching from the wings, the newlywed son's brothers and sisters. The so-called fortune the new wife would bring with her would be divided amongst them to make up the sister's diary, to set up a son in his own farm or business, or pay for escape to America or Britain. If there wasn't enough money to go around, the alternative for a son who didn't inherit the farm was to stay on sufferance, helping with the chores, never achieving any status in his own right in the community, forever the boy going to his father or married brother to ask for half a crown to travel to a match or share a few drinks with the men in the village. And if there was no worthwhile dowry, sisters might stay too, living out their years in spinsterhood, helping out about the house, a figure at a spinning wheel on the edge of the family, battling the loneliness. A tragic truth is that during those years, there were more unmarried people in Ireland than in any other country in which records were kept. 80% of all males between 25 and 30 years were unmarried, 62% of all women, a blight on humankind. Many found rural Ireland dull and stultifying. Some, perhaps the unmarried brothers and sisters, were casualties of its restricting conventions. But education had been available to many of them, and many had skills. And now, at the turn of a switch on the wireless set, they could hear of a better life beyond the parish, more exciting, freer, and better off. Many of them made to break free of the land, and our own towns and cities became the new homes of the rural disenchanted.